All right, so file systems are uh, part of the part of the operating system where the user has files. You all use files. You know, all have files. Word documents, PowerPoints, Java, you know, files that contain your Java code. You save them out on the disk drive. You decide you want to make changes to them. You bring them into main memory. You make changes. You hit save again. So from your point of view, a file could be logically, could be the kind of file that is um, all your data is you know, start to finish and kept in a certain order. They could also be uh, like records in a database where they're not necessarily kept in order. And uh, we might, if you want to read and write or update stuff, we might only want to get parts of them of the file, not the whole file, and it doesn't have to be in order. And then we have to decide how we want to write our files out on the disk drive. And there's several ways we'll talk about doing it, and some of those ways could make saving to the disk drive or reading from the disk drive take less time. Okay, so a file system is just basically a ways of organizing the data that you have in your files and trying to get the best read and write times. Secondary storage is not like primary storage. Primary storage runs on electricity, so if you pull the plug on your computer, you lose it all. Secondary storage is uh, storage that if you lost electricity, would still be around. So examples of secondary storage are like, you know, flop, you know hard drives, floppy disks. You guys know what a floppy disk is? Okay. Yes, no. What? Yes. Okay. Read about them? Okay. <laughs> Optical disk, you know, DVDs and CDs, and then flash memory you plug into your computer. So those are, those are forms of recording memory, and they're not sensitive to electricity averages. So those would be secondary files. Okay, so every file would have a file name, and then uh, most file systems, you know, have interfaces to, uh, so you can edit the files as utilities for copying files, deleting files. Uh, okay, every file has data about the file, which is not the contents of the file, but who created it, who's allowed to access it, when was it last modified, what date was it last modified. Um, so that's data about the data, sometimes called metadata. Now, like I was saying, the file system needs utilities to retrieve the files, delete the files, copy files, have two different names have uh, indirect names to a file, so two different names for the same file. Um, so there's utilities for doing that. Um, every file has user IDs on your system who can access, have permission to access files. So a lot of these slides you can just you know read through. Um, and then there's the actual data in your file, the actual contents of your of your file. Sometimes called user data, I would have called it file data. Okay. And then there's no requirement that the files, the secondary storage, be on your media machine. You could be connected through the internet to a file server. That would add another layer of permissioning, and you'd have, your machine would have to log into that machine. They'd have to authenticate who you are uh, before giving you fun, you know, allowing you to access the files. Okay. So, from a logical point of view, from like inside your mind. The file, the two most common ways of thinking about files would be files that are sequential. So you, in your mind, the file starts with this data, and then this data goes in a certain order and eventually ends. And then there's also direct access files. That would be where you have a big chunk of data, not necessarily ordered, and you can in, uh, access parts of it. So if you had a database that had many users, and logins and passwords, and you needed to get one particular user to find out what is that user's passwords to see if it matches the one they're trying to log in now. You don't have to go out to the disk drive and get the whole file. All you have to do is get the part about that user. Bring that in, read it, or maybe modify it and write it back. You don't have to read and write the whole file. So that's where you're, ac you're directly accessing a particular part of your file. So those are from you know, a logical point of view. So now we have to store these files out on a disk drive. So, um, so here's a picture of you know, like the inside of a disk drive. So we have a disk spinning around, and there's a read-write head. That could, you know, has a laser, it can write to the disk, and if it has a light, it can bounce off the disk and kiss the reflection and see what the data is on it. 
And so, um, on the disk drive, it has tracks on it, right? Tracks. So one, you know, one, one groove around uh, the disk is a track, and then each of the disks are cut into like pizza slices, which we call sectors. So we, this could be the first sector set, like let's say sector zero, sector one, sector two, sector three, and then a block would be on a particular track within one sector. So we could call, so like for example, um, the address of track three, sector two, if this was like zero, one, two. So track three would be, this would be track zero, track one, track two, track three. So this would be track three, sector two. Okay, but just cause we happen to not be able to write the disk out linearly. In our mind, we would think of it linearly, but we need to put it in a small space. So, for example, track zero, sector zero, track one, sector one. On a disk, it would be like this. Here's track zero, sector zero, track zero, sector one, track zero, sector two, track zero, sector three. Then you move in one. Here's track one, sector zero, and going on. So just think of this disk as a linear line. You know, just think of it as a straight line. So we can kind of, you know, we're saving files onto the disk. We're going to save them like as if there's a, they're on a line like that. Okay. So a folder or a directory, Windows calls them folders, and Linux and Unix-based systems call them directories. Same idea. It's a collection of files and other folders. And the files will have like a file name, file type, you know, maybe the extension is it's a Word document, a PowerPoint document, who the owner is, when it was created, when it was last modified. Anything else that you commonly see in your directory? Okay. Then there's things you don't see. Non-visible attributes would be like where is the file located on the disk drive? What's the track and sector where the file starts? And then another thing is going to be the type. Once we get to the beginning of it, you know, then we need there's other information. The first thing we see is going to tell us like where the data of the file is. So these are two attributes that you're not going to see. So suppose, for example, now I'm just drawing that disk drive, the tracks and the sectors, and I'm just drawing them out linearly. So suppose, for example, we had a block. So this is this is one block. And then this is the next block. So suppose we had a file that took up one and a half blocks. So what we would do is we would write it in the first block and then continue it on the second block. And at some point, like right around the middle, we'll run out of stuff. So this is kind of just like wasted space. Well, so here's a question. Would you start your next file like right after the last one started within, you know, make two files share a block? Or would you just go to the next block and start the next file? There's pros and cons of both. So it, Everything in operating systems is, you know, there's good points and bad points. There's no right answer to anything. It's just arguing which answer is better. But would you start a new file right after the last one, or would you just go to a fresh block to start your new file? So the downside is this would be wasted space. This would be like internal fragmentation to that file. What would be the uh, disadvantage to starting the next file right in the middle of the block where the last one ended? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there'd be a little room to grow it here. If we so right now we're just talking about contiguous files. We couldn't grow it past this block. So yeah, we could grow it a little bit. But then the other thing is if we wanted to know where this file started, we now have to have we have to know the uh, tra uh, the track, the sector, which is the block. And then where in that block does it start? We have to report a third piece of information. We have to how many bytes into it that it started. So what we'll do, it's generally uh, done, is to just go to the next full block and start the file there. Now if we have another file that takes a block and a half, we're going to have more internal fragmentation. Then suppose we had a file C, which only takes 70% of a block. So it'll take up this space, and then we have some wasted space again. And then these blocks are not used yet. So these areas where we have internal fragmentation, 
And now suppose file B gets deleted. File B gets deleted. So now this block, this entire block is free. This block, which had two parts to it, the end of file B and some wasted space taken up by file B, this whole block becomes free. So now we have, on our disk, we have external fragmentation. Between file A and file C, we now have a big space in the middle. If a new file came along that could fit in here, that would be great. But if a file came along that needed three blocks, then we couldn't fit it in here, we have some space, space that could be wasted. So, developing new issues doing that. Okay, so suppose this is now like kind of uh, further back, you know, maybe there's many blocks in each, in each of these now. So if we had file A and then some space and then file B and some space and file C and space and file B and some space. And you wanted to insert a file that's too big to fit into any one of these external fragments. But you have enough free space altogether to hold the file. What can the operating system do? So what are some suggestions we can do here? Yeah. You defragment the disk. Right, so one thing we can do is we can have the operating system, so now here's the problem. When you go to hit save, we go, the operating system goes, hmm, no good, no good, no good, no good. Time out, take this file, copy it into main memory to free up this space, then copy it back to here. Then take this file, copy it into main memory, copy it back to here, and then copy this one over, and now we have a big bunch of space. That'll work, but it'll take some time, so hopefully, we don't do this too often when someone hits save, but from time to time we do it, and it could take a lot of time. So if it's important that that file gets saved quickly, that's not such a great idea. But if it's, if it's okay to make the person wait, that's a great idea. And then it'll make it easier, you know, room for files coming in. Any other suggestions that we could do? If the file can fit like a little here, a little here, and a little here? Split up the file. Split up the file. So we put part of it, so now the thing is this, our directory entry is gonna tell us where the file starts. The so we, yeah, so now if there's three parts to the file, and we can find the first part, how do we find the second and the third part? So, you start writing the file here, you're running out of room, now what do you do? And you know you have another part. You can uh, use that last space to the beginning. Right. So since we're saving addresses, so addresses on the disk drive are just, since we're now using blocks, it's a track and a sector combination. And just save a little space here to say, oh, here's the next piece. Then start writing it here. If, this, if you don't finish the file right before you run to the end, say here's the next piece, and then scatter it as needed. Now if we wanted to go get that file, it's going to take a little bit longer. It's not as simple as find where it starts and then just start reading the file in until it's done. And we read it and then have to pick up the next piece. So it'll take a little bit longer to read it in, but we can write it very quickly. Okay. And then an any other suggestion for how to scatter parts throughout the disk? And instead of, so your, well, your idea is to link them together, link the parts together. And any other idea, since we're going to have many, many parts, one thing we could do is create a big list of where all the parts are and then put the parts out. So we'll call that, that one piece an index. Say like we have three parts. So we'll say the first part is here, the second part is here, and the third part is here. Put that right at the beginning of the file. Right at the beginning of the file is you know where all the parts are. Um, those, so those are different ways to do it. Now for example, if you wanted to yeah, okay, so just as a recap, we can allocate files on the disk contiguously, meaning we require that the files physically reside in a row. You can only store it if you have enough space in a row to store it, otherwise go find a piece of space. Or defragment the disk to make, make space. We could also just link the parts together. If, it, if there's many parts to it, when you get to the end of a part, you just say here's the address of the next piece. And then we can also create an index for the entire file and then put it in all the spaces where it goes. So for example, if you wanted to, if, you're, if you have an application where you constantly 
delete. You don't, you, you don't edit a file, but you keep adding stuff to the end of it. So let's say it's a database of all your users, and at the end of the day, some new people have joined your website, and you add them to the end of your file. Which one of these allocations could help you find, help you to append to the end of a file? Which one would be the fastest? Contiguously, you have no choice but to read the entire file into memory, add your new stuff to the end, and then save it all back. Because you don't know where the file ends. All you know is where it starts. Oh no, I should know. You, you would actually know. You would, it would record where it starts and how big it is. So you actually could go to the end. If you wanted to know where the end of your file is and it was all linked together in pieces, there you'd have no choice but to read in every piece till you finally get to the last piece. Index, right at the beginning, you have a list of where all your pieces are. So you can just read the last index and that's where the file ends. So that's just an example of the choices you make depending on your application. You might have to, you know, it might be better to pick one over the other. Okay. Okay, so let's look at the different types of allocations, contiguous allocations. So with the contiguous allocations, we want to keep track of where the initial block is, and then maybe the number of blocks. Another thing we can do is say the first block and the last block, but how where the where it starts and then how many blocks it is is all we would need to know. So for example, if an end block file started at block B, then it would end at B plus N minus 1, would be the address of the last block. So we could very quickly get to that one, get to the end of the file if we want. So how would, a, how would the files look on disk? So maybe the red file, you know, let's say, so our, 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 our uh, disk system starts the outer track sector, you know, track zero, sector zero. So this red one represents the first file. Now the second file is this kind of line color. The file starts here, goes here, around to here, then in one track, here and here, and it ends here. And there might be some wasted space at the end. Uh, maybe I should have showed some fragment, internal fragmentation. Then the next file starts here and goes like this jumps into the next track and it ends here. Then there's um, empty space on our disk, and now another file starts here and continuously runs through here. So that's examples of files on a disk drive, a circular disk, where the allocation was contiguous. Yeah? Would the gray block be external fragmentation? After right. the yellow. This one? This? Okay, yeah, this would be external, meaning it's outside of any file. It's not caused by any file, it's just that there is... So maybe there was a file here and then someone deleted it. So a file was put here, then this file was put here, and then this one was deleted. So, and we didn't bother pushing this one back. So this would be external fragmentation. So wasted, not, not wasted space, but if we, if we ever get a one, one block file to come in, we could put it right there. But if we had a two block file coming in, we can't put it, and we're required to make it contiguous, we couldn't fit it there. We'd have to find somewhere else. Does external just mean the whole block is contiguous? No, so external means it's external to any file. It's unused space that, um, yeah, external fragmentation is space between files that just because of the way files have been written and deleted, we have little spaces between them that are externally fragmented. So using links, we're, we're going to use up those fragments. So using a link list could, could use up external, could, could eliminate external fragmentation. Okay. Um, okay, so with So with linked, with linked allocation, we want to have um, the address of the initial block, and we could also have the address of the last block. That would be a good thing to have, too, in case we happen to have an application where we just kind of append on to the end of it. So that would be a good help um, to do that. Okay, and then this would have no external fragmentation occurs. There's internal fragmentation, space that is lost, the size of the links, so that space we're putting on the disk drive. And that could be some wasted space at the end of the last block. Okay. 
So on a, on a disk drive, it might look something like this. We have, um, we could have this red file. This red file is one. Then the orange file, see, where does it start? So the orange file starts here. So here's the data of it. Now here's the link to the second part, which is pointing over here. So here's the orange part two. Here's the link to the third part, which is here. Here's the third part, and here's the link to the fourth and final part. And the file ends like right around here. So this is some wasted space. No, wait, yeah, this is wasted space. And then these spaces here, here, and here are not part of the file, but instructions on the disk drive where the next part is. So the light orange part is data on the disk drive that we lost because of this file, choosing this file. The purple file or maroon file starts here, and then here's the link to the next part, and the file ends right here, and then this is some wasted space on that block. Then, and then if a file is indexed, um, so we said that the index would be, if a file is of type index, so that's only internal to the operating system, so it's stored on the disk, scattered throughout the disk, and when we take the address to where the file is, that's going to take us to a collection of addresses of where the parts are. So um, it would be too clumsy to draw it in a circle. So for example, we can have three files in a directory, file A, and file A is located at track zero, sector two, and it's an indexed file, so the type is indexed. File B is, starts at, or, or the index is located at track two, sector zero. So if you wanted to see, the con if you wanted to go and gather the contents of file A, the operating system would read its located at, it's an index type file, located at uh, track zero, sector two. So here's track zero, sector zero, one, and two. So the file starts right here. So we would read this block into memory. And all this block is is a bunch of addresses of where the parts are. So the first part is track three, sector two. So track three, sec track three sector zero, one, and two. So the first part is right here. The next part is track four, sector two. So here's the first part, here's the second part. The third part is track seven, sector zero. That's the third part. And then three, three, right here's the fourth part. Same thing's true with you know, the other two files. So now here's an interesting question. What if we have so many parts Right? So how much space do we need to pull an address to a sector? All we really need is a track and a sector number, right? Two digits. So maybe two bucks. Two bucks. Two eight-bit numbers? No, this is bigger than that. Two numbers, right? So not too much. But suppose we had so many, um, so many parts, so many sectors to it, that the index could not fit in one block. What could we do? I shouldn't have put that up. Let me go back. So there's a however much data is in one block, we have a list of block addresses. Suppose there's so many parts that we couldn't fit them all into one block. So we need two blocks for the index or many blocks. So what could we do? Should we have like a, so now the index is kind of turning into this problem that we had where, you know, do you, would we make a contiguous index? Would we, you know, would our operating system require that indexes be contiguous? Or would we have linked indexes? Or would we have indexed indexes? Yeah? I guess that depends on how many times you expect that to occur. So, yeah, I mean, so yeah, if it doesn't happen too much, but but right now we could so basically we're just we're just using the same the same uh, the same idea of what we had before just to handle the index. We could say if, if the index can't fit in a block, we could require 
because it's going to really be tough now if we have to get parts of the file to have the index to, you know, if the indexes aren't contiguous. So we get a rule that the indexes have to be contiguous and then the links could be scattered. We could also decide, you know, yeah, like you were saying, maybe if it just happens to grow into a two-block index, maybe we could just put a link to the next index, and then we'd have a way to get all the indexes. And then the other thing we could do is we point to an index of an index. So that's a collection of indexes, and then it tells us where all the blocks that contain indexes are. Gather them all together, and we'll have all the indexes. So that would be kind of like a trick. You would go to get the index to all your indexes. Now with all your indexes, you can then find all the parts. So that would be a multi-level multi indices or a tree structure. Okay. So, so now we have different ways of storing disks. And we said one is contiguous. So what's the advantage of a contiguous file? What's the advantage and what's the disadvantage to requiring the file be contiguous on your disk drive? Right, if you wanted to read the whole file, not just part of it, like a database, if you wanted the whole file and it was contiguous, once you find the beginning, now you're just spinning the disk, reading it, and it, it comes right in. If it's linked or indexed, you read a piece of it, and then you find out where the next piece is, and you have to like start spinning the wheel and you know, so spinning the disk drive over and over and over. So, so it's easier to read the file in if they're required to be contiguous. The downside is, Sometimes it's hard to save it because the operating system has to go out to the disk and find a contiguous space where it'll fit. And if it can't find anything, it has to start pushing files around to make room. So saving's a lot slower, reading's a lot faster. The advantages to linked and indexed is we can just take the disk as is and scatter it around. The downside to that is if we go to bring the file in, it takes longer. So if there happened to be some downtime, three in the morning, or your computer's been running and no one's touching it, and the operating system decides, here's a good time to take <coughs> files that are scattered all over the disk and put all the blocks together. Even if, even if it was an indexed file, it would still be good to take all the blocks and put them contiguously in order. Because when you go to bring an index file into memory, you go and get the indexes, so now you have all the indexes, and you say, okay, let me get the first piece. You read the first piece, and the read-write head is right now at the beginning of the second piece. So you say, okay, where's the second piece? And guess what? Your read-write head is right there. So it's still good, it would be nice if the file was contiguous. So if you had, so this is just, you know, like a GIF that's just saying, a GIF file, that's saying, you know, if you have a file that's not contiguous, and they were in parts kind of scattered all around and had some empty space, it would be nice if the operating system came by once in a while and just started reading the pieces sequentially, writing them into a temporary area here, and rewriting your disk so that the files are actually contiguous. So some kind of dopey trick questions are, can a linked file be contiguous? It could, and actually it would be nice if it was. It doesn't have to be, but it could be. And it would be nice if the operating system once in a while came along and did something like this. Okay. Okay, so now we want to take into account how much time does it take to get a file when you go out to a disk drive. So a couple things have that. When you go to ask for something over the disk drive, if the disk drive is sitting idle, it has to start up. So there's, you know, some startup time. Um, hopefully that happens very quickly. And then we have to uh, move the read-write head to the track of where your file starts. And then when we start reading the file, we have to then, you know, we have to traverse. So in order to do that, we're going to tra traverse n number of tracks. And then based on the speed of the uh, read-write head, some constant, you know, that's part of your disk drive, um, we would model the time to get the read-write head to be on the track you want to read as whatever the startup time is, times, you know, some constant to do with the speed of your disk drive, times the number of tracks it has to read over. So that's how much time it's going to take to get your read-write head to the track you want. Then we have to spin the disk around to the sector you want. The sector you want, so that's going to be like a rotational delay. On average, it'll be a half of a spin. 
right? On average, it'd be a half of the spin. And then, if the file was contiguous, we can now start reading the data. And that the, the disk spins at the same rate while we're reading it and also trying to get to the beginning of the file. It's running at the same rate. So we're trying to read in so many bytes of data. We're trying to read in so many bytes and there's so many bytes within a block. Um, so n is the number of bytes on a track and b is the number of bytes we're trying to read into the file. Then b divided by n would be how much time it would take to read that much data divided by this um, rotation, you know, the, how long it takes to spin the, the uh, disk drive. So the whole time to, break, to read in a contiguous file, the whole thing would be these three terms added up. So this is the amount of time to get um, the read write on to the track we want. This is how much time to spin it to the position we want. And then now if the file is contiguous, how much time it takes to read in all the data. We don't have to read the wasted space at the end of a track, we just have to read in all the bytes of the file. Okay, so now there's some algorithms. If you now have many processes running at once, making requests to the disk drive. So the question is if the read write head is going to go, you know, from the outside all the way to the inside, picking up data. Um, and many requests are in the queue. To read data. The question is, should, should the read write head just gather all the data of one file and then when it's finished then start the request for the second file and when it's finished go back? Or should it try to save time by handling many requests at the same time? And the idea is kind of like an elevator in a building. Right? If you're in a building and you're going from the third floor to the 20th floor, but there happens to be somebody going from the 10th floor to the 12th floor, so while the elevator is servicing you, they might pick up that person, handle them, and then go back to handling you, rather than take you to the 20th floor and then come down and get them and take them to their floor. So it's not good for you, it slows you down, but it helps them, right? In general, both of you are helped more than both of you are hurt. So the, operator, so the operating system can, or the disk drive, the people who manufacture your disk drive, can use any one of these algorithms. One could be first come, first serve. So if someone wants a file, gather it up however it can be gathered up. If it's an index file, read the indexes, go find the pieces, gather up all the pieces and give it to that person. Then handle the next person. The other one is if you have a read write on wherever it's located, if you have a bunch of requests in the queue, sort them and satisfy the one that has the shortest time. Kind of like an elevator going to the person who's closest to them take them where they want to go and then say, okay, now who's the closest to me now? So the downside of that one is someone who's far away from the read write on could take a long time before they get service as long as new ones keep showing up that are nearby. So then kind of an improvement or maybe a, a more fair way of doing that would be to take, to scan the, the uh, scan the disk. Start at the beginning and work your way, start at the outside and work your way to the inside of the disk taking all the requests along the way. Kind of like an elevator starting at the ground floor and going to the top floor and only picking up people who are going up. Don't pick up anyone who's going down. Then when you get to the top floor, you start coming, you start coming back down and pick up people on the way down. Then some designers thought that's a little bit unfair to somebody who just missed as the, as the arm went by, their request just got finished. Now it's going to go all the way to the other end and then handle all the requests coming all the way back. So a, circular, so a circular scan would be you start on the outside track, the read right head moves all the way to the inside, handling all requests along the way. When it gets to the inside, it immediately goes to the outside and then starts handling requests again. So that would be a circular scan. And then the end step scan is the one where the, the read write head goes back and forth but only handles the one in the direction it's going. So very similar to the idea of elevators trying to be designed to be efficient picking people up. Okay. So files that are direct, uh, direct access files are basically files where um, you only want parts of your file and you would have, uh, it would be very, 
it's a good idea to have indexes to where the parts that you care about are. And then you could read those parts and you can either make modifications to them and write them back and you don't need to bring in the entire file. So those would be direct access files. So if you happen to have an application, like a database is a classic application where you have a direct access file, what would be the best way to store it on a disk? As like a contiguous file, a link file, or an indexed file. This would be a good application to store it as an indexed file. Index file I like this. So any of the logical, yeah, I guess maybe there's some trick questions on, on tests would be like, logically you could have sequential files or direct access files, and physically you could locate them as uh, contiguous files, index files, or um, link files. Is there any combination that you couldn't do? Like, could you take it? Is there any logical um, file organization that could not be implemented using any of the physical ones? Or can everyone be implemented every way and it's just a matter of one's better than the other? So really, we can store any file on a disk any way we want. But if you put a, a linked file, uh, if, you, if you have a direct access file where you're only going to read parts of it at a time, and you put it linked, you would really take a lot of time to find stuff. You'd have to read through all the links just to get the one part of the file you care about. Okay. Um, okay, and then a further topic within a block, so that's a track and a sector on a particular track, you may have, um, you may have records on it, which is maybe like, you know, a, a subset of the, uh, of the block. So you could have, you know, fixed, fixed blocking, so that's where there's a fixed length of all records being used. You could have variable length span blocking. So you could write variable size records into your blocks. And if a, if a record starts on one block and has to finish on another one, you can link them together. And you may want to, for expedient reasons, you might want to have them not span. So if a record can't fit, into a block you started on the on a fresh block. So you'd have more fragmentation, but maybe you could read files any quicker. Okay. And if you happen so here if you happen to go out to a file, this would be a, a direct access file. If you happen to go out to a file and you need to bring in many records, but let's say you wanted all the all the employees in a database who work in a particular building. So maybe you have an index to all the employees who are in a particular building and you can actually predict which uh, records, while you're bringing in one record, you can predict where the next one is. So you could use queued access, which would then bring them in faster if you know where they're going to be. You can then take where they're going to be and sort them and as the read write head is moving back and forth, you can bring them in quicker. If you can't predict what, how they're going to come in, the order they're going to come in, then you're just doing basic access where you're going out to the disk drive and bringing in the parts. Uh, you bring in the blocks as you know you need. Um, and then one final advantage is there's, there's actually a company, I think in uh, Edison, that's you know, a memory, memory manufacturing company, and they're all about getting data off of a disk drive as fast as possible. But one idea would be to have parallel disks, even each having their own read-write arms. So if you had a, you know, let's say you had n disks and your file had n sectors to them, if you reported them across n different disks and you went out to read them, each disk brings in one part of your file. So you're kind of reading the uh, sectors in, in parallel. So the more disk you have, the better. It's just you have simultaneously reading and writing uh, from the disk drive. So this is, yeah, techniques when you know you really need to read the data off the disk drive really fast. Okay. So any any questions just about how you know logically, physically? Logically is from the user's point of view, physically is how we're gonna write it to the disk drive. A couple of different ways of writing them. Why have these different ways? Some take longer to write, and therefore less time to read. Some take longer to read, and therefore less time to write. Depends on what your application is. You decide to do this. But it used to be the uh, IBM mainframe 
when you created a file, there was all these questions you had to answer. You want it to be queued access, basic access. Is it a logical file, a direct access file? If you want links, how many records get written into a link? Do you want the records to be scanned blocks? You know, you had to answer like 10 or 12 questions and then <laughs> hit create file. And now, with now on Windows, you just put your mouse on new, you pick new, and you type in a file name and you hit enter. Well, clearly one of these choices is being made for you. You didn't say I want it to be an index file or a sequential file. It was decided for you. And you could set parameters to change the way this operating system does it, but those decisions were made for you. Much faster than creating a file. 